from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is Georgia Dorn, and I'm the head of the Hispanic Division of the Library of Congress. And I can say that this library is the home of Borges. He always said when he came to visit us many times in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, esta es mi casa, this is my home. So it's a great pleasure to welcome here his wonderful widow and collaborator, Maria Kodama. Um, so at this very exciting event, we'll be headed by the Embassy of Argentina, by Ambassador Martin Lusto. He is Argentina's ambassador and minister plenipotentiary. He comes at a time when he will be doing a great job in rekindling the relations between Argentina and the United States. He's a graduate of universities in Buenos Aires and also the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's the author of many books and has been a columnist for major Argentine newspapers. He served in the government of President Cristina Kirchner. The ambassador was also a member of the Argentine Congress and he was a world fellow at the Yale University. Maria Kodama is the uh, collaborator, wife, and soul of Borges in many ways. She was the writer's collaborator for many years, and she's the administrator of the estate of Borges, one would say the guardian of the estate. She, uh, she was a professor of literature at the University of Buenos Aires, and the translated with Borges, El Libro de, Al de la Almohada. So Sofnowski is professor of literature at the University of Maryland in College Park. He's a graduate of um, University of Virginia and uh, had founded the Institute of International Studies at the um, University of Maryland. He was the vice provost for many years <coughs> at the University of Maryland. He, he's, he's traveled uh, with Borges also at some times. And he was professor, he, and he has uh, written a book on Borges, Borges y la Cábala. And, and he translated El Libro de la, de la Almohada. So with us, the three speakers, Thank you, and, and, and Ambassador. Thank you, Georgette, and good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, usually when uh, ambassadors are asked to speak about a great fellow countrymen. We are given written pieces um, that tell their deeds, their personal characteristics, and sometimes our own experiences regarding uh, these people. I've done that in a, about you know regarding Borges in a recent seminar that uh, George W. U. Uh, University organized, and I'm very glad that I'm not going to embarrass myself tonight by doing that. The reason being that today among us, we have the, for this commemoration and homage to one of the greatest uh, writers in world literature, we have the person who knew Borges the most and who knows his work the most. We are really honored and I'm uh, really pleased to be able to introduce a writer, translator, literature professor, the creator, the creator of the Jorge Luis Borges Foundation and Besides all that, the writer's widow. So Maria Kodama, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Maria has dedicated her whole life uh, to spread Borges' legacy around the world. So I think that the best thing that I can do is to begin this presentation by quoting Maria herself. When asked last month why Borges' work was becoming increasingly relevant, she replied, because his work not only tells a story, but also underlies within philosophy, religion, and scientific curiosities. And the proof of this is, is, is that after he left, the fields of mathematics, philosophy, neuroscience also became interested in his work. This also happened to Jules Verne. In each century, a person is born, neither better nor worse, but who possesses the potential to see what we don't see. And that person plants the seed of fantastic literature, which is a reality today, as his space travel. Borges certainly saw what other people could not, and he, generous, 
generously shared his magical worlds, letting us navigate new dimensions. This is true to such an extent that uh, critics were forced to coin a new word, a, youth, a, a neologism, Borgesian, mm -hmm. to capture the, I wouldn't say worlds, but the magical state of mind that Borges invaded and, and gave us. Maria, with her tireless work, uh, not only helped make this magic world remain alive, but also uh, to, for this world to gain an ever-increasing number of followers. Recently, Maria published Homenaje a Borges, a book that I think that uh, Saul mm -hmm. has in his hand, where she complied uh, 20 lectures she has given at universities and institutions worldwide during the last 30 years. This is a, a clear example of Maria's work. Also, as Georgette said, we are really honored to be celebrating this here today, not only because Borges, is, Borges uh, claimed this to be his home, but also because it is a library. Uh, and uh, libraries are important not only in work in, in Borges's life, but al also in his work and in his stay here in, at the US. The Library of Congress has collaborated with the embassy to, to present you this amazing array of uh, uh, first edition books by Borges's, a documentary, and some audios of the Argentine, Argentine writer that are part of the library's collection. Now, as I said before, I'm so glad I don't need to speak anymore. <laughs> and to speak about Jorge Luis Borges, I give the floor to the person who knew, knew him the best and whom I really thank for coming here today as our special guest. Maria, thank you very much for being here. It's an honor. And Saul, the floor is all yours. Thank you very thank much you. and enjoy. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Georgia. This is home for many of us, so it's always good to be back. Uh, before we start, let me introduce Melissa Gonzalez Contreras, who is a PhD student at the University of Maryland, and she will be summarizing the comments that Maria Kodama will make uh, in response to some of the questions that I prepared. Empiezo. Yes. ¿Qué era para nosotros el arte? El texto que cierra tu homenaje a Borges quizás nos sirva para trazar un itinerario. Teniéndolo siempre presente, ¿cuál es la primera imagen que se te aparece al decir Borges? I'll translate. Uh, in this book that the ambassador mentioned, Homenaje a Borges, María Kodama has a text that is called What Was Art for Us? And that's the final text that closes the book that I think may serve us as an itinerary for tonight's conversation. So having Borges always in mind, present, the question is, what is the first image that comes to mind to Maria Kodama just by simply saying Borges? I don't know. Espera que lo prendemos. Permiso. Yes, uh, excuse me, I understand English and I can speak, but I cannot speak it properly. Then uh, that's why I'm going to answer in Spanish. <laughs> but you can ask me English. Okay. Um, no, the first, it's not that, no, it's not the imagen. Realmente is, como decían en España en la antigüedad, es de oídas que no de vistas. Es decir, eh, la primera aproximación que sufría Borges sin saber que era Borges eh, fue la lectura que me hizo una profesora que debía enseñar inglés, y evidentemente no me enseñó, pero yo me divertía muchísimo con ella porque me hacía eh, un resumen de lo que ella estaba leyendo, que eran textos para adultos, por supuesto, y los en español para que se ella con su lectura. Eh, y lo, lo más interesante es que una vez me leyó los dos poemas ingleses de Borges y se los dedicó a Beatriz de Villoni Becker, eh, una mujer de la que él ha estado enamorado, de vivir en Suiza, en su allí. Y eh, 
para una criatura de 5 años es un poema eh, me llegó porque decía él que él le ofrecía a ella su fracaso, eh, su soledad y agregaba el hambre de mi corazón para una criatura de 5 años el hambre de corazón no, porque es, pregunté porque el hambre de corazón, el hambre de retorno <risa> yo tenía 5 años y bueno era, bueno, era realista entonces ella me contestó que el, el hambre de corazón eh, era el amor y que yo ya iba a saber ya era el amor, ¿no? y esa fue la primera vez la segunda vez fue también de oídas que no de vistas yo tendría 10 años y cayó en mis manos una revista esa revista seguramente era azul entonces yo empecé a leer Nadie nos vio desembarcar en la una en la noche las ruedas circulares y yo dije, ¿qué es esto? lo leí hasta el final sin entender una palabra pero hasta el día de hoy si tuviéramos que quemar por una ley la obra de todos los escritores salvando solo una esa es la única que yo salvaría y es muy interesante porque muchos años después, a los años, en el salón del libro, eh, publicaron y me dieron para que yo hiciera el prólogo un libro de entrevistas que Victorio Campo había hecho a Borges describiéndole fotografías. Entonces llegó un momento en el que ella, yo lo leí atentamente, tenía que hacer el prólogo, y en un momento ella le dice: Borges, Acá hay una casa que tiene un jardín a la izquierda y una escalera a la derecha. Y Borges contestó, si es esa, es la casa de la calle Anchorena, donde yo en una semana escribí las ruinas circulares. Durante esa semana yo trabajaba como con mis amigos, caminaba. Pero lo único que quería era volver a esa casa para escribir ese cuento, porque nunca ni antes ni después pude escribir un cuento con la intensidad con que yo escribí ese cuento es decir, esa intensidad es lo que le llevó una chica de 10 años que no entendió nada pero que hasta el día de hoy quedó atrapada por ese cuento porque sería el único que yo salvaría si saliera a hacer y se tendría que sacar su novio en México y eso es fascinante realmente es, es fascinante y lamenté tanto que Jorge ya no estuviera porque a él le hubiera encantado porque yo le decía, le decía pero qué le gustó de ese cuento digo, no sé, mi intensidad una cosa pero él nunca me dijo eso pero se lo dijo en, ese, eh, en esa entrevista a Victorio Campo cuando Victorio Campo le describía la foto sí. que realmente es fascinante ¿y esa es la primera imagen que te viene a la mente? ¿es ese cuento? es ese cuento, sí es ese cuento bien, sí. good luck <risa> Uh, this is just going to be a summary, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the first memory is not really an image, but it's the uh, oídas uh, from uh, hearings. Yeah, sort of like hearings. Um, the first time was um, a teacher uh, who taught her to, to speak English. The teacher would read the, whatever she was reading at the time to her. And one day she read two poems by Borges in, um, that was dedicated to another woman. She was five years old at the time. Not the woman, but the... No, no. no. <laughs> in the poems, uh, Borges offered his solitude to this woman and his hunger of heart, hambre de corazón. So uh, Mrs. Kodama, being a five-year-old girl, uh, felt intrigued by this description and asked what it meant. Her teacher responded, that's love. One day you'll understand. The second time was when she was 10 years old, um, reading a Revista Sur. She read a text by Borges again, and uh, according to her, she didn't understand it either. <laughs> Um, and in an interview with Victoria Ocampo, Borges mentioned a house where he uh, wrote Las Ruinas Circulares. And he mentioned that he just wanted to return to that house because that house allowed him to write with intensity that short story. And this is 
what captured Mrs. Kodama from Borges, his intensity. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> Indeed. So, well, all right. Uh, there are several stories in which Borges, since you said I should, can, te lo, lo pregunto en inglés o en castellano? De una vez? Sí. Si, si no entiendo, te digo. Bueno, uh, in a number of stories, there is a certain motif that comes up that, uh, and he does it also in Tadeo Isidoro Cruz, la biografía de Tadeo Isidoro Cruz, that there is a moment in a man's life, I imagine in a woman's life too, that one will forever know who he or she is. So the question is, what do you think was that moment for Borges? Well, I cannot say what uh, was that moment for Borges, but uh, I can say what was that uh, moment uh, in Borges' life for me. Good, that was the second question. <laughs> <laughs> and that was uh, uh, a moment in which uh, you know that all was the Nobel Prize was for you know, the Nobel for him. And then once uh, we have to go to Santiago de Chile to receive uh, the doctoral honoris causa from the Catholic University. And then um, it's a phone call and I said, well, he's from, uh, uh, from Sweden. And he said, uh, oh, no nos hagamos ilusiones. <laughs> and he went to the phone to, to, to speak with the person. And I want to leave him alone because uh, it was his conversation and I always went alone to mm -hmm. go uh, and leave him alone when he was talking with someone. And then uh, suddenly uh, he take me uh, strong from the arm to tell me that I have to stay there. And I listened. He was in silence and then he said, okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate this thing you told me. But there are two things that a man cannot uh, stand. Sobornar or dejarse sobornar. To bribe or to allow yourself to be bribed. To be bribed. Then after this, uh, my duty is, and I am going to go to Chile. And he hung up. And then I said uh, to Borges, but Borges, you know, after this, uh, it was to this further. You can say you are a leader. And he said, um, Usted diría eso? You know that, no? Then he took me in his arms and said, OK, it's better this way because I became the icon of the Nobel Prize, the man to whom never <laughs> the, the Sweden Academy gave the Nobel Prize. And I'm very happy because if not, I am a number in the list. In this way, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's all so beautiful because, uh, you know, nothing can change his uh, principles. Nothing ca can change that. And I admire and love him more at that moment that uh, it, that could be. <clears throat> Thank you. You had an excellent English teacher, by the no, way. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. <laughs> They, you understand? <laughs> yes. It's <laughs> a great job. <laughs> why her and why me? <laughs> I remember one time he also said that uh, he's been a candidate for so long that people probably forgot that he already got it. <laughs> yes. And that's why he's no longer a candidate. Um, in this same book, there is a text that is called Que es el tiempo? And you begin with a quote from St. Augustine that says, Que es pues el tiempo? Si nadie me lo pide, lo sé. Si quiero explicárselo a quien me lo pide, no lo sé. Uh, what is time? If somebody is asked me, if no one will ask me what it is, I know what it is. But if someone is going to ask me to explain it, I do not know what time is. The question would then be, what was the time with Borges? And what has it been for you since 1986? It was with Borges from 1986 that, that continued. Because uh, 
Ja, is de Wittigerichting in Ayamron was toen ook bij mijn vader, dat was Japanese. En dan heb ik een andere way nog teken, maar worst, dus dat was niet de een van de Occidental people. En voor mij, ik weet niet of hij is nog anymore physically with me, maar is of hij is inside me forever, in a letter, in a day. That's what you always say? Yeah, that's thank you. In one of those essays you also wrote, creo que nadie puede ser mero espectador de un proceso de creación, sobre todo de alguien que como Borges emanaba una fuerza tan especial para la que uno se sentía arrastrada. Uh, in one of these essays, Maria Kodama says that nobody can be just a spectator in the creative process, particularly in Borges's case, because there was such a strong power that was emanating from it that one <coughs> felt that was being carried away by it. My question is, is there some sort of text that you remember in particular that carried you away more than others, besides the circular ruins? Besides the circular ruins, uh, uh, maybe the Bibliotheca Rabel. Why? Or maybe the Immortal. Why? Well, the Bibliotheca de Babel, I suppose it is for this idea, no es cierto? De, de que todas las cosas de alguna manera vuelven, de, de que en realidad nadie entiende lo que está sucediendo, ¿no es cierto? Que es un poco cuando uno reflexiona lo que nos sucede a todos, ¿no? Y eh, así que esa idea sí es la que, la que me fascina de la Biblioteca de Babel, eh, esa idea de la circularidad, de la imposibilidad de la comprensión, y de no saber en realidad quién está. Perdón. De no saber en realidad quién está dirigiendo, quién está, digamos, ordenando esa biblioteca, ¿cierto? Entonces, eso es lo que me fascina de ese cuento. Y en el inmortal, me parece. Muy, muy interesante y la manera de la comprensión de Sinacán, de Campo y Amigo, eh, Sinacán que, que sabe que va a morir, eh, y de pronto comprender que, que no importa eso, que él está más allá de todo eso y que, que bueno, que es como si él mismo fuera esa eternidad. Eh, que no le importa esa vida que va a ejercer. Y, y eso se lo revela eh, la figura del tigre, ¿no? El tigre que está dando vueltas así alrededor del lugar en el que él está prisionero. Entonces esa, esa indiferencia o esa, mejor dicho, esa sabiduría de comprender eso eh, me fascina también. Pero yo tuve una experiencia muy especial en el desierto, ¿no? que cuando cambió el siglo yo nunca tomo vacaciones y según mis amigos esas eran vacaciones masoquistas. <risa> Como yo soy muy amiga de Juan Bautizoro, él eh, me ayudó a que yo fuera en una carpa con los familiares de su secretario, que yo creo que comía arena y pronto no importa, al desierto con una carpa. Y una tarde yo recuerdo que no puedo explicar cómo, pero porque uno intelectualmente sabe que uno no es nada, ¿no es cierto?, intelectualmente. Emocionalmente también sabe que uno no es nada, pero en ese momento, en ese lugar, sentí desde otro punto que yo misma no sabía que existía en mí, que no soy nada. Y eso para mí fue una revelación que cambió mi manera de ver muchísimas cosas en mi propia vida. Uh, the two texts that 
she referred to is La, la Biblioteca de Babel and El Inmortal from La Biblioteca de, Manel, de Babel. <laughs> uh, she, she likes the idea of that everything, I'm sorry, that no one understand, understands what happens. Um, the circularity that they don't understand, they don't know who is in charge of the library. And from El Inmortal, the idea of the comprehension of the person that's in of the imprisoned, that he knows that he will die and that it doesn't matter. Uh, the idea of the eternity. And it's the figure of the tiger that reveals this idea to him. Um, so the, the wisdom in comprehending this. And she has this fascination with the desert. Um, in one trip to the desert, she realized, she had that same realization, that she came to, to realize that she does, she is no one. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Esto lo vamos a dejar prendido porque eh, Sinacapa, of course, is in las ruinas circulares, and therefore we can sort of blend in with an inmortal. Let me ask you something else. Eh, he probably dictated a lot of text to you, and the question is, did he tell you in advance I'm going to dictate a poem? A, short story, I'm going to do this or that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how he arrived from the moment that he began to dictate to the final version, <coughs> knowing full well that there was never a final version because he always corrected yeah. the next one and the next one and so on. So how did it start? When uh, well, uh, the funny thing is that uh, he starts uh, from his dreams. Uh, fortunately, he remembered the dreams he had in the night. And then uh, he think in the morning if that is going to be useful or not. If it's not going to be useful, he, okay, he told that. Uh, and if that is going to be useful, he began to think if it's good for a poem or for a prose. And once he has that in his mind, he began to dictate all the poems, all the prose. And it's very interesting because at the foundation I have a photo. Uh, I think it's uh, the author was Comisano, but I'm not sure. But it's a very beautiful photo. Bodes is with the head uh, mm -hmm. like this, and the eyes strong, uh, not closed. And that's the way he began to dictate. It was if like uh, he, being blind it is not sufficient uh, for him to go inside himself and go out with the poem, with the verse, mm -hmm. or with the prose. And for me, that is the image of the beginning of the creation. For me, that's why I had that photo at the foundation. Huh? I saw it. It's a spectacular it's photo. Uh, you mentioned that there was only one poem that he never touched because Kafka dictated that poem to him. Yes, yes, yes. that was very, very funny because he was always correcting and correcting all the prose and verse. And, and then he, he, I was amazed because at one point he never correct that. And he said, but Boris, why uh, you never correct uh, this poem? And he said, no, I can't. I have to wait another day. And then when Kafka corrected that to the poem, I'm going to correct. It's not my poem. It's Kafka's poem. <laughs> That's funny because at one point he talks about una letrina llamada Kafka, although he spells it differently. <laughs> Uh, uh, Borges used to talk about the music in words, the sense and sound of poetry. What kind of music did you listen with him? Uh, well, it's very funny because Borges said that he was uh, uh, dumbest sort of musicality. 
for solo, musical guitar notes. Musical deafness? Uh, deafness, yes. He said he was musical deafness. But it's the same because he loved, for example, uh, he loved very much Brahms. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also, for example, uh, Bach. And it's strange because if one is uh, cannot hear the music, uh, it's strange that the Bach like That's right. was very, very clear. And also, he loved, uh, for example, uh, the tangos de la Guardia Vieja because he said that that kind of tangos are happy tangos, are uh, double sense tangos. Uh, and he doesn't love Ravel because he said that Ravel uh, did with the tango something sentimental y llorón. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't like it for that reason. And he loved also the milonga because mm -hmm. they are very uh, happy. And he wrote quite a few. Yes, yes, of course. He wrote for the six cuerdas, you know, for the six cuerdas, I don't know. Oh. And uh, tangos y milongas, and he loved that. But the, the, the tangos of the Guardia Vieja, the tangos he yeah. heard when he was a little boy in mm -hmm. Palermo. First stage. Yes. <laughs> How was the Buenos Aires that you shared with him? What kind of Buenos Aires did you work, walk through with him? Uh, he liked it very much. Uh, uh, we walk uh, across, through the river, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, usually the Tigre uh, he likes very much, and we went uh, the river is the Tigre because he said that that was the Sauvage Venice. Mm. And then <laughs> You traveled a lot with him, and the result, one of the results is the Atlas. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the travels with Borges were very, very funny and very interesting. And he has Don't said, tell the funny stories yet. I have them for later. <laughs> no, no, I have no. Please wait. Yeah. <laughs> no, we enjoy a lot. Um, we do a lot of travels. And in a moment, we know better the states than, uh, than I knew better states than Argentina because he did uh, um, semesters of here in different mm -hmm. places to the States. And then uh, in, that's why I, we traveled a lot inside the States. Yeah. He also said Americans are sort of a strange people who say hi to each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. He, but he admired the, the American uh, literature, and that's for him was very interesting. I mean, it can't exist or not for Borges if we have a great literature or not. Mm -hmm. But for him, it's that story. Mm -hmm. Let's go to one of the funny stories. I heard it, but I think it's worth for the people to hear it. And um, there was a time when you created names for each other. Oh, yes. You were Ulrika and Javier Otárola. Mm -hmm. How did those names come about? Uh, it was a name from uh, Sara uh -huh. and, uh, and from a, a short story that Borges wrote. Right. Uh, that, uh, present, uh, that was a present for me, a secret present. And, uh, and that's why I, I put that name, so the Estela Familia Borges. So do you, you came up with those two names for yourselves? Yes, sometimes. As all people who is in love, or mm -hmm. we put us different names, many interesting <laughs> names. For example, <laughs> those are the two published. Tell us something that is not published. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I say it or if I don't say it. We will not repeat it. Go ahead. <laughs> no, it was very funny. For example, one of the names was um, 
Uh, once uh, an English uh, journalist uh, was reported, and when he was in an interview, I, I went to another place. And then sometimes he sent someone to ask, and maybe I'm tired. That means we have to run out because he was tired. <laughs> <laughs> but he can say that he was tired. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he said, uh, when I went there, and said, are you were tired? I said, uh, uh, I, I, I'm a little tired. He said, no, 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 I call you because I want that this journalist uh, tell to you what he said a moment to me. And he, this journalist said that uh, when he saw us uh, coming into the room, immediately he thought, mi prospero de Ariel. And I said, OK, Ariel was it. So, and then the other name was Prospero de Ariel. Prospero de Ariel. In honor to that <laughs> journalist that saw in us Prospero de Ariel. OK. Not to be repeated. <laughs> Not to be repeated. <laughs> Eh, Borges said to you once, su padre la educó para mí. Yeah. Your father educated you. Your father educated you for me. Yeah. And I was thinking of that in the context of a trip that you did with the hot air balloon. Ah, Can you tell us about that trip? Yes. Uh, I was looking, I was in the States and I was looking something for a friend of mine who asked me if I can uh, found the direction for him. Uh, then suddenly uh, I saw the balloons. And I said, the boy is here at balloons. Or oh, immediately we have to drop the mosquitoes and we have to go to make the trip in the balloon. And at that moment, one of the companies said that it was all uh, impossible to, to make the trip because uh, a couple who is going to be married uh, was uh, take uh, the, the, all the balloons for the, the wedding. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we took another one, and that yes, that was possible, and uh, and we went. But we had to go very very early in the morning. Because, the, of course, in the balloon, it's, uh, we didn't know that, <laughs> it's a um, fire, no? Oh, yes. Of course. And then, uh, all night, he asked me, but the, the canastito, the, the, the basket, the basket, uh, it, it's, uh, the basket is going to be in limbre or in uh, plástico. And I said, what is, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, Plastic <laughs> uh, and, uh, and when we arrived, uh, the, the man said to us, uh, of course, uh, we go in the balloon and a car uh, follow the balloon. And then when the balloon descend, uh, we have to leave uh, uh, in a caja box of wines uh, for the people in whose land we uh, we land. We land. Uh, and one bottle to, to, to drink uh, for a safety uh, trip. And then uh, it was very funny because uh, the man said, no, no, but the, the senor in the car is for you. And he said, no, 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 we came here because I want to uh, He wanted to be on the balloon. the balloon. And the man said, but it's dangerous because it's a car, it's a car and you have to put uh, the put in that, in that hole and then pass the, ah, it doesn't matter. When I was young, uh, when I was young, uh, I, I montar a caballo, montar. I used to ride a yeah, horse. Yeah, ride a horse, and it's not easy. It's not difficult, and you, can, and you are a very strong man, and you can help me. And I said, <laughs> I called the man and said, listen, we came here for a informing inicia. He went to work. It's you completely useless. No matter what you say, he's going to uh, to be in the balloon. Then we finish his story. I sign as responsible for my own. You you take care of him and the other person who is going with us also. And I sign that I make myself care of myself and you are not responsible. Nothing that not responsible for me, Borges. But for, to me, for me. But not for Borges. Uh, you didn't sign for him. 
you know, I sign for myself. Oh. I say to this man, right. I say, okay, you take care of him. I sign for you that myself, I am going to try to do the things by myself, but that you are not responsible if something happened to me, because you have to take care of him, not uh -huh. of me. And <laughs> the man cannot understand the word. How old was that person? <laughs> I can I can remember it. Maybe it's there, there. I can remember, but uh, lately, like twenty or something. You know. That's a good age for yeah. harder for you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. he enjoyed a lot. And then we go out for the balloon, and he was so happy, so happy, really, really, very, very happy. And uh, and the man, of course, cannot understand the word. <laughs> he, he, That's better. He was amazing, yeah. amazing. <laughs> yes, he said, but this hair is getting very different. <laughs> And then another thing very, very beautiful is when he can uh, uh, embrace the tiger, the she tiger in the Buenos Aires. It was so beautiful. I have a so beautiful photo of him between the, 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 the patas, the, the La Tigre Rossi. He was a she tiger and her name was Rossi. Hmm. <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> I'm going to show you the photo. Great. Yes. The foundation. Yes. Good. What are the words that you associate with Borges? The words that I associate? Words. No matter what. Everything. <laughs> OK, with Borges I associate uh, freedom, uh, happiness, uh, and uh, what was the first one? <laughs> I can't remember. Freedom. If you don't remember. Freedom. Happiness. You said freedom? Yeah. Happiness? Yeah. And? Loyalty. 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 In that order? Uh, yes, I suppose in that order. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the trip to the pyramids. And the trip to the pyramids, that, uh, that was a very uh, strange experience. We had a chauffeur that was a copter, and we just wanted to go to the pyramids and pass the night in the desert. And then the copter said, no matter the noise, possibly it was going to be wonderful. And he contacted us at the Sahara pyramids. And he, the Zibo, who is uh, and then from the, the Las Pirámides, mm -hmm. salieron uh, en vivo. Mm -hmm. y, entonces yo, Parece que no. sí. entonces yo le dije, bueno, mis amigos tienen razón, esta gente no parece muy confiable, a uno le falta una oreja, y posiblemente, como dicen mis amigos, podemos morir en manos de ellos. No, no, es maravilloso, hemos venido aquí, esto es maravilloso. Entonces, el copto, que lo guía, el chofer, eh, dijo, bueno, eh, llama a dos, que hacen una sillita de oro, porque se sienta, se agarra del cuello de ellos, y ellos empiezan a correr. Entonces, yo pensaba que al entrar a las pirámides, estos no miraban nada, se iba a lastimar, se iba a golpear la cabeza. Y yo le decía, Borges, tú estás corriendo detrás de ellos. Borges, cuidado con la cabeza, cuidado con la cabeza. Y los egipcios decían, camisa, camisa, y veían con los ojos. Entonces Borges, sujetando los cuellos de los que lo llevaban a la de oro, se da cuenta así, me mira y me dice, María, no digas camisa, camisa, yo que sea una palabra obscena por la forma en que yo la repito, mis amigos, no diga cabeza, porque ellos decían camisa. Entonces me dice, ¿quién sabe qué quiere decir en árabe? Y ellos entienden en lugar de cabeza, camisa. ¿Hay alguien que sepa árabe y sepa lo que quiere decir cabeza? No. No, qué pena. Habrá que buscar. Habrá que buscar. Um, let me see if I started taking notes when she switched. Um, <laughs> Uh, there were homeless people that came out of the pyramid. Yes. One was missing an ear. And then the, the, they carried uh, Borges into the pyramid 
uh, but they were running and Mrs. Kodama was afraid that once they entered the, uh, the pyramid, since it was dark, they, um, he was going to get hurt. Um, so because she, she was being carried along by them. Yes, yeah. yes. And um, she kept repeating, la cabeza, la cabeza, your head. And um, the men that were carrying Borges uh, laughed and repeated, cabeza, cabeza. And so Borges uh, asked her not to say cabeza because it, he thought it meant something in Arabic and they were pronouncing cabeza. And it was probably an insult. An obscene word. An obscene word, yes. I have a couple more questions and then we open it to the public. One of them is, he knew a lot of languages, some of them self-taught. Yeah. And someone asked me, did he ever learn Braille? No, no, never. Why? It, it, because he always uh, uh, figured that it was a mistake. Because her mother, uh, his mother uh, lived for him and then uh, he said it is perezoso, entonces, bueno. Which is obvious from all the things he has done, yes. Perezoso para aprender. Right. Y después sí dijo que es una pena no lo había hecho, pero bueno. You put together a collection of books, like a library, you and Borges, and a collection of select books. I wonder how you went about selecting the books that you published in that library. The books he loved. Just the ones that he loved. And a question that, uh, and with this I will stop. Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine yourself doing anything else in your life? had you not met Borges, what would you have done? Uh, it's really interesting because um, I learned uh, classic dances and uh, my professor was born that I go like a Latin dancer. And then <laughs> he said, I have to do it. At that moment, uh, it initiated me, he said, I was, I was crazy. But I love her dance, and now I can't because I distend the ligament, or I can't walk properly. I adore her. She loves to dance, except there is a little problem with the ligament. <laughs> yes. Yes, with the ligament of my feet. Okay, uh, and then uh, what he said? Uh, well, in my family, uh, no ha habido bailarinas. Punto. Pero me dice, si usted quiere. Voy a hacerlo. Ahora, yo le voy a explicar algo, siempre me explico. Pero ahí fue pseudo democrático, porque no me explicó todo. Entonces me dijo, eh, si usted baila, tiene un tiempo para eso, y después no puede más poder hacerlo y se va a sentir muy mal. En cambio, eh, a usted le gusta estudiar, usted aprende fácilmente, a usted le gusta enseñar. Y eso no tiene fin. No me dijo que podía quedar tú, 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 tú como dicen, y, y bueno, era lo mismo, ¿no? Entonces me dijo las cosas por la mitad. Y entonces eh, decidí, eh, bueno, es difícil, no estudiar, no entrar al Colón, sino seguir estudiando. ¿Le hiciste caso? Sí, no me di cuenta que le hacía caso, yo quería que lo hiciera yo. <risa> Porque él no me dijo toda la verdad. Sí, es. Uh, so Borges said to her, um, there's no dancers in my family. Oh, that's but, her father. Yes, the father, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, he told her, if you decide to dance, you'll be able to do it for a while, but after that, you won't be able to. And on the other hand, if you study and if you want to teach, that's something you can continue on doing. And so she decided not to go to a teatro conon and continue studying. And teach. teach. And teach. Which is boundless. We don't have to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Even if some people want us to. Right? <laughs> um, before, before I turn it over, one more question. Uh, Borges said many times that he's an agnostic. Yeah. 
but at the same time he talked about mystical experiences that he had. Yeah. What happened there? How did he blend those two positions? Well, I think he blend uh, in the book, you know? Uh, he was a mystic, uh, Muslim. And, uh, just in case. Just in case? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, he said that he has a mystic experiences uh, when he woke uh, at night, like he woke, and one was in the Bagno Sur, in a tardecer, in a anochecer. He sintió que estaba fuera del tiempo. Y entonces esto lo empezó a mucho, ¿no? Y esa es la experiencia que él sintió así como el plato que no era, digamos, normal, lógico, sino que había como otra dimensión. Pero, en fin, eh, en, en la obra de él hay muchísimas citas eh, a la Biblia, pero eso era por el lado de su abuela inglesa. Él me decía que en esa época, eh, para los católicos, estaba prohibido leer la Biblia por temor a la mala interpretación. En cambio, los Hacían bien, ¿eh? <risa> en cambio, los protestantes, hasta el día de hoy, tienen las Biblias, que no te sale noche, de luz, etc. Y su abuela sabía de memoria, participante de la Biblia. Entonces, eso le estuvo muy fuertemente unida su, también a su parte digamos, intelectual, y la prueba es que de, de, a lo largo de su obra hay muchísimas menciones de ¿no? la Biblia, Jesucristo, no desde el punto de vista de la creencia total, pero sí de una... Búsqueda de una coherencia. Búsqueda de coherencia. Mm -hmm. Sí, sí, sí. Bueno, ahora vamos a escuchar una experiencia mística fue durante una caminata en el barrio sur, he felt that he was out of time, and that impressed him. He felt something that wasn't normal, wasn't logical, as if it were another dimension. Uh, but in his, uh, in his work, there are a lot of references uh, from the Bible, and this comes from his uh, English grandmother. Um, she knew parts of the Bible by memory, and this influenced his intellectual life, not from a, a, the point of view of him believing in religion. Did he always think El Golem is his best poem? No, uh, he changes sometimes. Of course. Yeah. Sometimes it's another, another, another poem. Do you remember any other one besides El Golem that he considered his best or his favorite? No, I can't remember not the name, but the, the, the point, but uh, sometimes he said, uh, uh, I think, Piloto uh, Tigre, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, le gustaba mucho, y también uh, el que escribió a su abuelo, en, <coughs> creo que salió ahí, pero no, perdón, no en el siguiente, ¿no? En el en el frente. En el frente a su abuelo que murió eh, cuando tenía Carlos. cinco años no. eh, y entonces este, el abuelo en su delirio eh, muere en una batalla, uh -huh. ¿no es cierto? Y es, es tristísimo porque dice que él tenía cinco años cuando su abuelo murió y él eh, lo dijeron que había salido de viaje sí, sí. y entonces él caminaba por la casa tratando de encontrar a su abuelo, ¿no? Es una cosa muy triste. Muy triste sí. So besides Golem, uh, another poem that he mentioned a lot was El Otro Tigre. Uh, and one that he wrote for his grandfather, who died in battle. Borges was five years old when his grandfather passed away, and he was told that he had gone on a trip. So Borges, as a child, used to look for his grandfather, not knowing that he had passed. Open to the public. Questions? Somebody will bring you a mic. Okay. Um, 
pregunta en castellano y después traduzco si quieren. Sí. Me interesó mucho lo que dijo acerca de la libertad y la lealtad, como dos de las, de las palabras que, que la hacen pensar en Borges, porque creo que tradicionalmente uno asocia la lealtad a, a cierta obediencia incondicional, a cierta proximidad constante y la libertad por otra parte a una suerte de partida o de separación. Y yo no creo que las dos sean <coughs> contradictorias en absoluto, eh, creo que se pueden conjugar bien y creo que dado que dije esas dos palabras, ustedes lo hicieron, me interesa saber qué eran la lealtad para ustedes y la libertad. <coughs> Y como se um, And in English, um, basically, I think that traditionally freedom implies a certain kind of unconditional proximity and obedience and um, loyalty, I'm sorry, and freedom, a kind of distance or departure. Um, how did you and Borges combine the two in order to achieve that happiness that you described? What was loyalty for you and what was freedom for you? And why were they not? Bueno, eh, yo creo que no, no, no son contradictorias la libertad y la lealtad, ¿no es cierto? Porque la libertad eh, no es ir al final de la libertad, es saber que yo puedo llegar hasta acá, me guste o no me guste, porque después de aquí para allá está la libertad del otro, y me guste o no me guste, yo tengo que respetarla. Y la lealtad es, digamos, la la cualidad por la cual, eh, eh, tengo que leer por, por la cual, la cualidad eh, a través de la cual nosotros, eh, digamos, eh, estamos eh, interiormente, eh, ¿cómo puedo decir?, eh, no obligados, pero eh, sí eh, tenemos que tener la conciencia de que no podemos, eh, digamos, ni traicionar nuestras ideas, ni traicionar al otro. ¿No? Es decir, tenemos que ser fieles y a nuestras ideas, a nuestros, a nuestros ideales de, de vida, ¿no? Y yo creo que esos son los términos que de alguna manera eh, no se contraducen, sino que eh, en mi forma de pensar eh, se unen, ¿no? Se complementan, digamos. No sé si contesté bien. Gracias. Uh, for her, loyalty and freedom are or don't contradict each other. Uh, liberty, uh, liberty is not freedom, rather it's not libertinaje. Okay, we have translators here. How do you say libertinaje? <laughs> it's not, it doesn't exist in the Spanish language. We don't practice it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's proceed. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> was better the other way. <laughs> and with respect, with respect to uh, loyalty, uh, that conscience of not, um, not going against someone else's ideals, and she feels that they complement each other rather than contradicting. Another question over there? Gracias. Eh, bueno, lado castellano la pregunta. Con respecto a esa experiencia de Borges, de temporalidad, esa experiencia espiritual que, que mencionaste que había ocurrido en el sur, yo inmediatamente se me ocurrió asociarlo a la lea. No sé si es que existe alguna conexión. Bueno, posiblemente sí exista, ¿no? Posiblemente esa experiencia me haya ayudado a escribir ese, ese cuento. Eh, no sé, eh, eso no, no puedo decir con seguridad, pero no es, no es improbable ya que esa experiencia es una experiencia realmente mística, ¿no? Sí, de alguna manera, puedo llegar a ver así todas las cosas en un punto. Y es muy divertido porque él me contaba que ese cuento, eh, ese cuento, o ese cuento se lo reveló, eh, mirando un caleidoscopio. Estaba jugando con un caleidoscopio y de pronto se le ocurrió eso. No a todos nos pasa lo mismo. Por eso no hay un inglés. Sí, go for it. Uh, <laughs> ¿Me permitís? Ya sí, que el otro está de turismo. Perdón. Sí. 
Um, it's possible that that mystical experience of Borges could have shaped Lalek, but she doesn't know for sure. Um, because they're both, or it could be both uh, mystic experiences. Um, but that story came to Borges, the short story of Lalek, while playing with a kaleidoscope. <laughs> kaleidoscope. <laughs> He did mention one time that uh, he was interviewed by a Spanish uh, journalist who got very upset with him because uh, Borges mentions the exact location of where the Aleph is. And when he told the journalist that he had made it up, the guy got very angry and left him and said, vale, 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 and left uh, We have a question hey. over there. I can do it in English right away. Okay. Please. Pero hacemos en, en español. ¿Cómo era Borges en el día a día, considerando la cambiante y constante actividad o la política argentina? ¿Era un pasional? ¿Lo tomaba a veces con humor? ¿Se enganchaba terriblemente, digamos, y se preocupaba mucho? ¿O, digamos, eh, los cambios políticos de Argentina, que fueron muchísimos en, en toda su vida, eh, realmente lo preocupaba mucho y de alguna manera lo quería expresar en, en los libros. ¿no? Eh, I, I can translate the question. Yes. I'm asking the, the life of Borges uh, in relation with the Argentinian political situation that probably in all his life changed a lot. That continues to change every day. <laughs> But uh, I want to ask how was his humor with that, uh, how was his relation with that, if he was very anxious with that or not. Or, or he was very passionate with the pop, uh, poly politics of Argentina, or how we feel it? Well, I think that uh, everybody knows uh, what was his uh, reaction in front of uh, the different political situations he had to live. Uh, and uh, he was always very clear. Um, I was I don't know that you can say passionate to someone who said the truth and try that the others see the truth that is for him, of course, uh, because each one has a different truth uh, in his mind. Uh, but uh, he was very, I think, uh, very clear uh, because he almost always was against uh, uh, any kind of uh, dicta dictatorship. And uh, that's why, because he was free. I mean, a uh, free person cannot stand uh, that kind of um, rules. And he was very, very clear, and uh, there are all these interviews in the newspapers of the time, uh, what he thought about that. Uh, yeah. One final question. Yo tenía un comentario muy rápido, que es que cabisa quiere decir Dio en árabe. Ajá. Dio, claro. Thank you, Dio. Thank you. That sort of makes sense, considering that they were carrying him on, on his arms. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Eh, quería continuar sobre el nombre del corazón. Eh, y preguntaba, le hacía una pregunta a la astronómica. Eh, ¿Cuán quisquillosa era Borges para la comida? Es decir, ¿qué cosa él no comía? ¿Qué cosa sí le gustaba bastante? ¿Qué no tocaba? ¿Qué siempre quería comer? ¿O volver? So, en inglés, um, keeping with the, with the, hunger, the heart's hunger, um, how picky was Borges uh, in regards to food? What uh, would he not touch? Uh, what would he really like to eat or drink? That is definitely a Cuban question. At <laughs> last. <laughs> uh, well, uh, he loved his uh, arroz con manteca y queso. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and cheese. <laughs> and it was very funny because once uh, we are always, um, now is, I think it doesn't exist anymore, to a restaurant whose name was Maxine, that was in uh, uh, Why is it near Florida and Buenos Aires? And then we were in Cafe Paris, and a gentleman uh, invited us to the uh, to the restaurant uh, in Paris. And he said, uh, "Okay." The man began bringing the list of wines, 
and they're just doing what you need to be doing. He says, no, I don't drink wine. Then the man began to explain the, the food. And, the, <laughs> and the, the, the chef, uh, the restaurant in Maxine in Paris, uh, was baking. And Borges said, OK, I want to eat a horse como un rico queso. <laughs> then the man said, but Borges, we are in Maxine's. And he said, uh, this is a sucursal of Maxine. And I said, Borges, the man of Borges, I said, Robert, listen, I, uh, it's the best restaurant in Paris. And Borges said, uh, Robin Kuleo said, said, OK, I want, uh, I, I want to know uh, how is the taste of my favorite dish, apples, commented and also in the best restaurant of the world. <laughs> On that note, we thank Maria Kodama for sharing these memories with us and to be continued at another time. Thank you all for being here. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.